bringing forward two incredibly smart and talented people that are not only musicians, but they spend a lot of their time and their work using digital tools to not only promote things in their day jobs that have creative elements to them, but also for their own uh, creative musical practices. So, um, we'll grab a seat and we'll, uh, we'll uh, get going. Then we'll start, we'll let uh, our two panelists uh, introduce themselves. Sure, hi, I'm Alana Horton. You know, everyone at the table wears a lot of hats. I'm sure every one of you in the audience wears a lot of hats. Isn't that what it is to be a maker in so many ways and why tools are helpful? Um, some of the hats that I wear, uh, the first is that I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cedar Cultural Center, um, music venue in Cedar Riverside. We do about 200 shows a year, as well as some grant funding programming um, at the Cedar. Uh, and I am also part of Umbrella Collective, which is a theater company based in the Twin Cities as well, uh, that does new works of theater, uh, brand new pieces that are created in ensemble. And then I'm also a drummer. I drum with a couple of different groups, um, one being Bella Yaga, and another being Contributions in Film. And so, my bands, I definitely help with a lot of promotional stuff, and same thing in my theater company, and same thing in my job. So. I can talk about how tools kind of scale on all of those different levels and sort of how it's for me. And I'm Cassie Ut, and I as well wear a lot of hats. Um, so I am a, one of the co-founders of Monocat Data, and we do uh, data analytics and tool development and um, technology solutions for uh, organizations and artists. So we focus on the arts. I'm also the founder of The Fourth Wall, which we're opening next year. But we're a hybrid co-working um, rehearsal facility for performing artists. And I also perform. So I do opera and musical theater in the Twin Cities. And I also uh, manage a couple of theater company websites as well. Cool. And we had talked before, and I thought that uh, as a group, and we thought that it would be important actually to go into the audience really quick and just here, who are you, why you're here, tell us like, what's your musical practice, and then um, why specifically this topic was interesting to you, like what you're hoping to learn from. Hi, I'm Megan Lacey. I uh, am part of a band, Megan Lacey the Bird Watchers. I also run Megan Lacey Music, which is, okay, so Megan Lacey the Bird Watchers is original music, kind of folk, rock, Americana type music. And then Megan Lacey Music is strictly like weddings and private events, cover songs, all of that. And I thought this would be fantastic because actually today was my last day at my job. And then tomorrow it starts wow. musical everything. <laughs> nice. Congrats. Thank you. Um, Terry Hughes, I've um, been at this for only a couple of years now, so I'm still trying to find my voice, figure out how to do hybrid electronic orchestral music and uh, I come to these because I just trying to learn everything I can learn. So. Cool. I think when I thought about this workshop, the idea was that 
there's so many different tools that you can potentially use to help you organize your finances, your shows, your bookings, you know, just information that you're constantly using to grow your musical careers. And for me, it's, there's so many different things and it's hard to unpack that. But I find out that when I do, that there's people who are like, oh, what's that? And that's sort of how I've learned myself. It's like, even we, the, the three of us exchanged a few emails and there was a couple of things in there that was like, ooh, like, that's a nugget that I'm like looking forward to like hearing about like what they do with that and how they use that in their um, in the musical or in the creative life. But the first question that I sort of threw out to everybody that uh, I wanted to begin with is just like, what are the, it, it, was, it was pretty obvious from the email exchange, but uh, what are like the main tools that you use? <laughs> like the one or two were, like real main ones. So we were talking a little bit before about this as well, but I use Google Sheets for like everything. Um, so to collaborate with just about every every group I work with and individuals within some of my own performance as well. Um, to kind of collaborate on ideas, timelines, um, assigning things to each other if that if that makes sense as well. And then from like another thing that for me um, being in kind of theater and performance is finding either those Facebook groups that are announcing gigs or asking for resources so that I can start to create those connections and the Minnesota playlist, um, which has is like every audition is always there. Um, and so finding a resource like that has, has been really helpful for me. Can I get a sense, do any of you Gmail and the Google Sheets. It's all of you, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, mean, I think it's totally revolutionary. Just and I think about. I mean, I haven't even just being asked to like step back and take a take a thing through all this on the panel. Just like having the ability to collaborate with people in person. We can all have our devices. We come to a shared understanding, and then we all have access to it. And we can like grow and change things. Mm -hmm. It's where I start pretty much every project. And if that's like an album timeline. Like you can have it all in one place, and you can. I think one of the coolest functionalities that I've been using a lot in all of the Google apps is, like you said, tagging and assigning things yeah. to people. Have you been doing this? So if you do an at and then put an email address, it puts a, an assignment. So you can actually go into whatever you're doing and assign things to people. So my coworkers and I do this a lot. That we'll have one like meeting doc. And we'll take minutes or whatever, and then if there's action steps, we can actually tag people and their email addresses and it sends them a reminder to their email addresses that this is an actionable item for them. So I think that can be a really cool way to just keep pinging people and reminding them of things. And yeah, do they have to have Gmail addresses or can it be like anybody like at like college address or hot or whatever? I think it can be I think it can be anyone okay. too. Because anyone can collaborate in a Google Doc yeah. or Sheet. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, there are certain like corporations that might limit their ability to see it. So if you're working with someone that works at like a manufacturing company or like an architecture firm, they might restrict their employees. So it would just be part checking. But all the like Gmail, Hotmail, mm -hmm. those should. Okay. And people can have uh, like a, a Google account when you're using Drive without actually even using the email part of it too. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I've done, yeah, I've for all of my BMs and for this year, actually all of the arts groups I work with, all of our stuff is on the cloud now and it is in Gmail. So for this year, what that looks like is we have sort of a business account, and so lots of people are collaborating. But for my band, like Beliaga, for instance, we have one Gmail address and then the drive for that holds all of our band materials. And we have that archived into different projects. Like different shows we've done, and then that can be done in like a directory for a year, and it makes it a really easy thing. And you can share someone on the big folder, like here's all the projects, or we have different people coming in and out of the project sometimes. So being able to share scores that are all in a folder under one project, it, it makes it a really easy place to like both archive everything in case your computer or something gets destroyed, and then also be able to share and use and find stuff. Yeah, I've even found lately working collaboratively with people that 
files that are not even set, you know, that you can really open it with Drive, but it will at least store them, which is really nice. So like, you can't probably open up, I don't think there's anything you can use to view an EPS file uh, in Google Drive. There might be, can, uh, yeah. I think there's some, I think there's some applications you can use to open up different files, but there's some things you can just use it as like a storage locker, you know, yeah. whether you're in a group that's using some really proprietary software, you can dump a file in there, you can share with your collaborators, maybe it's making music or maybe it's... And that's something I would bring up for artists. I love getting Google Drive folders of assets. That's something that actually like is a great thing for me. If you're wondering where to put assets from like your electronic press kit or making things more easily downloadable, um, that's one of my favorite ways. Yes. What are assets? Uh, assets is the term that at least we use for press photos, um, band biography, or artist bio. Um, any sometimes people will say or share songs or video links. So at least what we've done for Bella Yaga is create like a Google. There's a kind of a couple subfolders. We have one that's just called assets, and within that, there's three things. One is press photos. One is like for artist bio information and we kind of have a short version and a long version that are two separate Google Sheets. And then we have one that's like quotes and other information that someone might need. So that's like a doc that has press quotes that people could pull, um, as well as links to some YouTube videos, which are all helpful for promoters. Yeah. Um, at least at the Cedar, I'm looking for the easiest way to kind of get all of those assets in one place. And a lot of the work that we do is kind of going back and with artists who might not have it all compiled into one easily downloadable place. Um, so that's what we do. And when even from my side, when I'm sending press, like information about an upcoming program, I actually put a link in a press release that's like, download press photos here, and it just links to a Google Drive folder of those photos. Um, and you can set it so that when you're sharing the link in that way, it's not, it's view only rather than edit. So no one can delete anything, but they can download and you could even go a step further from with it then you put like a stage plot in there, you could oh, put yeah. in a rider, you could put in all sorts of different things that a venue might need in one place and you might not even really have to mess with it, you just have one place for a venue to check that out and that could even be something that's available to a venue to look at if you're just looking to be booked there. Totally, and I forgot to mention that is something I see from national artists. They are sending me Google Drive links, and riders will often be an extra folder on that, or like stage plots, so you can have it all in one cool, clean and convenient place for promoters or other people who might be inquiring about it. And we were talking about it before. Did both of you say that you didn't actually own uh, like the Microsoft Office Suite because you just use Google Drive? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all you need. Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not trying to do like a big commercial for Google, but I think part of but it it's is, also free, so yeah, yeah yes. very commercial. <laughs> and so that's and that's sort of was an impetus for this workshop is pointing towards things that you can use that are free that are also going to probably have a wide use of this. Thinking about that. I think Google Drive is pretty safe to say is the big one. What would be sort of next on your list of different like digital tools you would utilize uh, in your work? I think you had mentioned this briefly as well, and I talked about it before, but I'm not I'm not a designer, like I'm a performer. I like think about things analytically, um, but I have gotten into using Canva uh, a lot um, to help me design for other social media for the organizations I work with or things that go on our website um, and even for myself as well and it is like even though I'm using the tool I've slowly like learned some of these design skills like through that tool so it's like a good like intro like you don't have your own graphic designer you don't have those skills to learn some of that as well yeah Canva yeah. C-A-N-V-A yes that was one when we were exchanging emails yeah, so they have templates for like everything, from like a, a Facebook banner to an Instagram post to um, like a resume. So there's a bunch of really great content. Question on that? Yeah. So I use Canva mm -hmm. to create like our band logo. Yeah. Um, and so I paid like ten dollars or something for like this bird image. Is that like 
good forever, or is that like you pay often? To no, pay you to have it forever. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would also say I do a lot of design for my job. I use Photoshop and the Adobe Suite yeah. for that work. But I have used Canva Suite, and I've found it very easy to use and like a great, like, cheap or free alternative. Yeah. Um, one thing we think a lot about in all the groups I'm doing is just sort of creating content that is going to be most effective for you in terms of the algorithms that you're kind of in. Um, so what that usually means is a priority on video is kind of where Facebook is heading. Um, so we make a lot of video at this time. Whether that's cutting down an artist video into a 30 second clip and putting some like information about when it is or creating new videos from scratch. Um, that's where we have put a lot of priority and where we're kind of moving for my bands too. One thing that my band Belliaba did is we actually made a series of videos for every song on an album and we've been putting them out sort of one by one every two weeks just to kind of increase the lifespan of the album, but also put it into a format that's accepted by the album. So I think if you're going to look into using any new digital tools for marketing in particular, thinking about video content is great. There's probably a video um, app of some sort if you're using a computer. Uh, I also heard of a Wii video yesterday. That's like an online video I can make software to. I can't speak to it. I haven't used it. But I was talking to someone yesterday who was like, I've been making everything on it. So there's a variety of new apps kind of helping you do kind of thing. What's it called? Me video. And I can look into that a little bit more. But sure. And one I'm, uh, so I think you mentioned the Adobe Creative Suite. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually use both Lightroom and uh, Adobe Premiere has like a light version of it called Clip or Clips that you can use that on you know, your phone or device and you can make videos on the fly that are actually pretty cool. You can, it'll sync up music if you have it on your phone, if you have an MP3 on your phone and you wanted to sync it up to the video, it does some auto syncing things that are really fancy, but it's, all the programs are really, really light and easy to use. The nice thing about Lightroom too is uh, if you're using Instagram or any other programs where they have these built-in filters, you know, like you're using them over and over and over, Lightroom has like an extra little suite of filters that are different than Instagram that can make your photos and you know look different than everybody else's. The other thing is, is you can do video. Keep in mind, you use photos to make a video. You don't necessarily have to be in motion to get it in that platform. Ideally, that's the case, but generally being in the video space these days right now as far as all the algorithms go is pretty valuable and it's starting to even morph more into using the live platforms whether it's Facebook yeah, or Instagram. That. That's something we've been doing more at this theater too is doing live videos. I would say a great way to select which digital tool to use on a video side is what the goal of it is. Mm. When I'm trying to do like a really speech, speech like show promotion kind of thing, whether it's for one of my or the event promoting, I generally go with a very edited down short thing that hopefully catches people's attention really fast. And I put advertising money behind that because it's cheaper to boost a video on Facebook than anything else. Mm. Uh, the It's like 0 0.003 cents per like impression, which is a lot lower than if I'm trying to give people awareness of like who an artist is, sometimes you can just do a live video. And sometimes I've seen one that used partnering with an artist to do something like that, of like play two songs in the green room, or just like do a shout out for a show and like just do something live and engaging that's kind of reaching that broader audience. And you can do that too as an artist in a practice room, like you're working on something big. You put a live video and let people see like what's happening behind the scenes and what you're working on. I think that can be a great for people. Um, I tune into people's live videos often. And I think that's kind of cool. Have you seen or found um, the sound quality to be important in people's like 
impression or mm -hmm. how much they pay attention to the video, if it's like good sound or if it's like live sound, you know, from a phone or whatever. Yeah, uh, the cases where we've done live videos with Seeger have all been with pretty acoustic artists mm -hmm. that picked up pretty well on a phone, like mic. I will say that there's a lot of attachments, like little like mic attachments that go along with phones that you can order off the of Jones on if you're concerned about sound quality. Mm -hmm. There's a pretty easy you know, solution to some of those. And some of it just could be like, for example, if you have like basic headphones, most of the smartphones these days have a built-in mic that you know you can access. That microphone is still going to be better than like the multi-directional one that you're going to get, you know, that's going to be playing the audio just naturally through your phone. Like, if you have that one place where it's going in and out, it's going to sound better than if you just, like, capture it live and you're catching everything. Or piggyback off that, um, there's a cable you can get called a TRRS cable, mm -hmm. which is, uh, it splits the microphone from the headphones mm -hmm. on the on the input jack, so then uh, the microphone side is just mono seek plug, any, any microphone that you could get down to a 3.5 mm or even a direct line feed from your computer and add that to the phone too. Mm -hmm. 